All right, uh, I'm ready. Uh, thank you for filling that time. And uh, thank you also for coming in the, in the day of the Super Bowl. Uh, it occurred to us, to several of us, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a clash of conf or, you know, conflict. Uh, cool, so my name is Juan. I started uh, the IPFS project. And uh, I am here to talk to you not about IPFS specifically, but really about IPLD which is a format that has come out of IPFS. And this is really the heart of the IPFS project or the ecosystem. Uh, everything else we do is a lot of hard work to make IPLD work really, really well um, with a whole bunch of different data structures in a whole bunch of different contexts and so on. And so hopefully after tonight, this is a new take on explaining IPLD, uh, you'll kind of get a better sense of what IPFS is about. Because IPFS, despite the FS uh, moniker in the name, it's not truly about files. It's just about content and data moving. And so it's a new kind of file system where you, know, you can also call the web a file system if you wanted to. Uh, but it centers on Merkle trees, as was explained uh, just before. So thankfully, I don't have to go and explain Merkle trees. So that you know, gives me more time. Uh, I'm also going to set a timer so that I don't run over. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to careful with that. <laughs> I've been known to take a million years, so cool. All right, this will go off in 20 minutes. All right, cool. So the talk is titled "Enter the Merkle Forest," and uh, you know, this is a whole bunch of the projects that have spun out of IPFS, and so uh, the middle one is Protocol Labs, a company that we're building to fund the development of all this stuff and more. There's probably more projects that you, you know, are not seen here. Uh, Multiformats, IPLD, and lib2p all came out of IPFS. Um, so did Filecoin, sort of, but that's a whole other story. Uh, these are things that we think are extremely valuable and useful to a lot of other systems and projects, and that's why we work hard to make them independent projects uh, that are not IPFS specific uh, and that can be used separately, that you can use in your own, in your own systems. Uh, so tonight, I'll talk about IPLD. So I won't give you uh, much about IPFS. But luckily, there's like dozens of videos online of me explaining it. So if you really were here for that, uh, I can give you some cool links. So the IPFS stack, and so IPFS is a, this you know, large distributed system for moving around a bunch of hash-linked data. Let's just say that's what it is. Uh, it decomposes into this stack, where at the very bottom, there's this lib2p thing that is all about peer-to-peer -peer systems and peer-to-peer -peer magic to get uh, to solve problems of how do you get two devices talking to each other across a variety of contexts or situations, right? So if this room right now lost internet connectivity, like connectivity to the rest of the world, uh, we should be able to continue working with each other. Our applications should still be able to work. Um, the, co the stuff and data that's in this computer and programs that are in this computer should be able to talk to the programs and data in your computers. If we were working on a, say, a chat room like Slack or working on a Google Doc or something like that, we should be able to continue working even though our connectivity to the rest of the world stopped. And so IPFS is a system that enables that kind of work, and it does it by combining IPLD, which gives you hash links and content addressing, uh, and layers all of that on top of libp2p, where libp2p is this whole bunch of grab bag of protocols to make it easy to do that connectivity, right? So leveraging hardware and software that's written for like specific networking, uh, you know, some, something like uh, use Bluetooth or use audio or, you know, a whole bunch of like esoteric protocols that would allow our computers to find each other, would allow our computers to transmit data to each other, you know, use Wi-Fi and find each other without any internet, uh, you know, introducer whatsoever, right? So lib 2 p does all that heavy lifting, all the peer-to-peer -peer magic, and it's kind of abstracted out so that anyone can use it, again, for any project. And so what IPLD is about is we call them Merkle DAG. It's not a great name. DAGs, unfortunately, we're kind of screwed in the nomenclature world. Trees sound much nicer, but calling it a Merkle tree is not exactly correct, but we can, we can go with tree because it's a nice m metaphor. Uh, and everything else, all the IPFS file-specific stuff, all the application stuff, all of that layers on top of IPLD. So you get a structure that looks like this, where all the lib2p stuff is like this madness around 
doing heavy lifting on very case specific stuff that's kind of you know abstracted away. And then you layer this really nice, simple interface of doing hash links on data. And you get the assumption that you should be able to create and resolve hash links. And on top of that, you can build a ton of other stuff. Like you can, you can build a bunch of different kinds of applications on top. And so this is what we like to call, um, you know, like this is kind of a thin waste uh, protocol, right? Like it's a thin waste model where you separate your whole construction into pieces where at the bottom a whole bunch of things can evolve and new things can be introduced and so on without meaning any change to the applications on top. So this comes from IP. So when you think about the IP protocol, it's a thin waste protocol because IP addresses and IP schemes could remain the same for 40, 40 or so years and counting. And, uh, and everything else can, can be separate, right? Like the underlying protocols underneath, whether you're communicating over radio or over ethernet or whatever, all of that can change and applications on top like you know, Google Docs or um, Slack or your web browser or whatever, all of that can change on top. And so similarly, we have a design construction that gives you that nice thin way so we can all agree on and then make applications that can work over any kind of networking. So I'll give you some intuition for what IPLD is. And so when you think about IPFS and you add some files to IPFS, this is kind of what it, the command line version of IPFS looks like. Uh, you know, you add a bunch of files and you get this like stream of output that says like added some huge horrible hash and then some file path, right? And then you get, this is adding a whole directory. And so what's going on here is that IPFS is looking at your normal file system, you know, like your POSIX-E, unix -E file system, and reading a bunch of files and reading directories and then constructing this huge graph uh, and using hash links to connect all of those pieces together. So it works. You know, you, you get something like this. Uh, so this is the, I think this is the corresponding graph for, for that. And so you get something that looks like this. Notice, by the way, that there's deduplication going on that foo.jpg has some of the same content as tree and cosmos.jpg. And so because you're using hash links, you can just start deduplicating a ton of content. So that's one cool thing. Uh, the other cool thing is that, as we heard before, all of these things are secure links. You can give somebody a, this hash and they can go and ask the network for the content matching that hash. And you can, you know, under standard security assumptions, you can assume that nobody can forge that content, right? Like nobody can, has the computational power to be able to invert a hash function to something else uh, so far. Depends on which hash function you pick, depends on whether there are attacks and so on. This, this is a big caveat there, but that caveat is the same as, you know, any kind of crypto anyway. So if that's broken, pretty much all, everything else is broken too. Um, and so there, there's, a, there's a nice facility also in IPFS because it aims to be this long-term project that we can even roll up our hash function. So if we someday discover that SHA-2 is broken, we can move to SHA-3. And if that breaks, we can figure out what to do then. Um, and I'll describe how it works. So you know, as we were discussing before, this is a Merkle tree, right? And Ethereum is a Merkle tree. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of other things that are Merkle trees. So this is Plan 9, old uh, OS. Its file system was a Merkle tree. BitTorrent, it's a little, I like to call it a Merkle shrub because it's like a really, really shallow Merkle tree. Um, <laughs> Git is this hugely long Merkle tree where it has huge commit graphs and so on. Um, and then Bitcoin and Ethereum are these massive Merkle trees, right? Like just enormous, like hundreds of thousands of nodes and, and growing, right? And so it's this really beautiful construction where um, all of these things, whoa, whoa. Uh, all of these things are distributed, authenticated, hash-linked data structures. So distributed because you can move them around across a bunch of computers, and authenticated because they're, you, know, you, you can check that the data is actually correct. You can check the integrity. You can check that it's truly the data you were meant to get, and so on. Right. So if I communicate a hash to you, you can again ask anybody else in the room uh, for the data that matches that hash, and you're good. And the cool thing about Merkle trees is because there's this recursive construction, I just have to give you the root. And now you can ask everyone for the next node, and then that node contains links, and you can fetch the rest, and so on. So I can, in a very compact representation, like you know, in SHA-256, 256 bits, tell you and I uniquely identify pretty much as much content as I want, as I have generated in the past and distributed to the network. Um, so this awesome compression fun function, in a way. And so these distributed authenticated hash-linked data structures, so I, 
hash length is sort of part of authenticated, but I want to express it, you know, pull it out as part of the definition because there's other ways of doing authentication, so digital signatures and so on. Uh, so you can think of IPFS as a Merkle forest. Uh, so instead of saying we have one huge massive Merkle tree like say Bitcoin or Ethereum and so on, IPFS is about creating a whole bunch of different Merkle, for Merkle trees and being able to resolve through all of them. So if content is on Git, awesome. If content is on Bitcoin or Ethereum or you know, whatever, we should be able to resolve through it and find it. And you're like, whoa, that sounds kind of crazy. How could I link from a Bitcoin node to, uh, you know, from a Bitcoin blockchain to a, uh, the Ethereum blockchain? You know, if, if I use the same hash, won't, won't that kind of collide? Like, you know, there's, it, that's not a non-trivial thing to do. And so that's what IPLD is for. It's about allowing linking across these different kinds of data structures. So we call it the Merkle forest. Uh, the way to like the definition we're going with at the moment is a common hash chain format for distributed data structures. And so it allows systems to interop systems like these to interoperate. And today we have support for a number of these already in IPFS. Uh, it's not merged into master, it's you know in the next upcoming upcoming release. But the cool thing is you will be able to, you know, make an Ethereum transaction and include a link to Git and be able to resolve through transparently over IPFS. So you'll be able to like have a na nice path notation and you know take the transaction of Ethereum and like walk down it, find the Git link, and you keep going down and refer specifically to all the underlying content. So it's a it's a little subtle of like why that's really cool, but it's like having a native API to every single one of these systems without having any of the code for those systems and having it all work. It's kind of like the web, but for hash link data structures. And it is also compatible with the web. So you can use it from any web browser or your terminal. How does it work? Uh, so you know, when you break it down, the properties of this thing is that you have a thing that gives you Merkle links or hash links. These are secure and immutable. And you have a path notation for how do you traverse through this graph. Uh, and you have these, like, we call them like universable or like nestable URIs, where, again, these paths are like just as URIs that you can like combine. And then you have a whole bunch of different serialization formats that are what gives you access to each of those different data structures. So you would have a different format for Bitcoin, and a different format for Ethereum, and a different format for Git, and so on. And with that format, gives you is the, the notion of how do you traverse through that data structure, right? So if, in, if you find a Git object, inside of it you see hashes, but those hashes from within Git normally just mean other Git objects. They don't mean Ethereum objects. So um, you need a notion of like, you know, how to, how to teach IPFS or IPLD enabled things to understand that format and understand wh what are the hashes and understand how to resolve through. And once you have that, which is actually quite small, it's a very simple interface. You write two functions. After you have that, you can resolve through this entire new data structure and plug it into the rest of the system. Um, little side note here is that we're thinking about and exploring how to write all of those things in WebAssembly. So like write them in JavaScript, compile them down to WebAssembly, and now you have them running on every, every architecture you want. And uh, the last thing I'll mention is that because we have things like JSON and so on, you want uh, to canonicalize the data so that you, you know, it's hashing safe. Uh, you could have the same JSON data structure, and based on how you serialized it, you may end up with different hashes, which is silly. Uh, the components of the IPLD project are CID, which is a content identifier. I'll talk about it today. It's a format for how you structure the hash links. Uh, there's a data model, which is basically just you can think of it as like the JSON data model or like an extended JSON data model where. You basically have strings, integers, uh, floats. I guess JSON doesn't have ints, but it's like the ba very basic things, maps, lists, and so on. Um, and out of that, you build everything else. Uh, and then you have, again, those serialized serialization formats I described. We have tools and libraries that you, know, you can use to work all the stuff. And then we have selectors and transformations. I won't talk about these, because these are kind of complicated and assume some understanding of the, of the thing. But I'll just describe what they are very quickly. With IPLD, again, you have these huge graphs of stuff, or like these huge Merkle trees. A selector is an expression, a path that allows you to subselect not an individual node, as a path would give you, but a subgraph, like an entire subgraph. 
And that is really useful to be able to um, you know, express to other peers like, oh, I'm not interested in the whole thing, but can you give me like this sub-selection? Or, oh, I really want to you know, download the very first parts of this huge file so I can stream it right into the browser and you know, start playing a video or something. Uh, so that's what selectors are for. Transformations is what happens when you add computation to the mix. When you say, here's a graph, and I want to turn it into another graph. And so here's, a co so here's some code that gives you, that when you apply it onto this graph, gives you some other graph. And you can then take that and like just you know, transform graphs into others. Uh, this is still ongoing work. The selector is close to done. Transformations are just beginning. Um, but you, know, you don't need that to al already be useful. So everything that I'll talk about today is, is already good and you can rely on. So the CIDs thing turned out to be incredibly important. How you create that format to link between these data structures such that it's tiny um, and you know, flexible for the future is where a lot of the magic of IPLD is hidden. Um, and it actually took us a while to, to get to it. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, on that. So I already talked about how IPFS has the ability to roll to different hash functions. We do that with a thing we call multi-hash. And so this is part of the multi-formats project that I described at the beginning. We have another thing. Uh, these are just different formats for making self-describing values. So the idea is that if you see some value somewhere, that should tell you what it is on its own. And how you do that in a very tiny, compact way, so, such that it's so, you know, binary packed so that people don't complain about you know, how much size it takes or whatever, um, is important. And what you get out of it, like the, the value of doing thing, this, is that when you see a hash, it will tell you, oh, I'm a SHA-256 hash, or oh, I'm a Blake-2 hash, and so on which allows you to understand what you need to do with that value. I'll give you an example. Let's take two, four outputs of, of, a, of different hash functions. And these are all outputs of the exact same value. And if you were giving, given these values, you'd be like, great, I have no idea what to do with them because I don't know what hash function it even is. Um, you know, they're all the same length. So normally, what people do is say, if it's 256 bits, it's probably SHA-2 to 56. If it's 512 bits, it's probably SHA-2 to 56. Oh, but wait, SHA-3, it's also 512 bits, or you know, whatever. Um, so that's annoying. So if you, why, why didn't the person that gave you the values, why didn't they just add a little bit of information right at the beginning of the value so that you know what it is? Uh, the, the reason this turns out to be important is that systems like Git and so on use hashes. And now it's, you know, all of this work has been done on these hashes. And SHA-1 is going to break. Like, it's already been, it's already broken. Everyone has known that they need to move to SHA-2. And yet, we still use those hashes for a lot of stuff. And we rely on the security of that SHA-1 hash. And if so much of the Git code depends on those hashes being a specific size, 160 bits, and like so much stuff just you know, creates and allocates buffers that are just that length, so that if you suddenly said, great, let's use SHA-2 and bump it up to 256 bits, so much code around the world would just break. And you'd have to do this enormous amount of effort. And so what's likely to happen is that Git is going to say, no, 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 we shouldn't jump up to 256 bits of security. If we're going to jump to SHA-2, we'll probably have to clip the hash to 160 bits and just roll with that. And that is just an artifact of them not giving you the length of the hash ahead of time. And so looking at this and being frustrated, uh, we made the format uh, called multi-hash that, uh, that tells you how long the thing is. Um, and that tells you what hash function it's coming from. So that if a system uses these things, they know that these hashes may be longer in the future, that we might roll to a much stronger hash function in the future that may be, I don't know, uh, you know, 10, 24 bits or whatever. Or that it's a different hash function altogether. Or maybe we figure out how to make super secure hash functions that are only 100 bits. And we say, oh, why, why are we wasting all this space? Um, you know, pr that won't happen, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, multi-hash is this very trivial, simple format that just tells you what the function is, tells you the length of the value, and the digest. It's self-describing. There's no assumptions, no lock-in to anything, and so on. So yeah, that means you have to maintain a table uh, of agreement on like what a code means, right? Like you know, 11 in hex uh, means SHA-1, and so on. Uh, but this turns out to be not that much work, and all of our distributed systems already rely on 
tables like this, right? So if you want to speak IP or TCP or whatever, you're already using tables. So it's not a big deal. There's a whole bunch of implementations of multi-hash. There's more, but I haven't taken another screenshot in a while. Um, and there's a few other multi-formats uh, protocols that, um, you know, you don't really need to know that much about them. Multibase is for allowing you to use multiple different kinds of encodings. And multicodec allows you to use different serialization formats. And so these are the three that we'll, we use uh, in CID and IPLD. This is the example of multibase, um, just another table that tells you what you're doing. You know, like if you have ever seen some base encoded thing and you're like, ah, oh, what is that? Is that base 64? Is that base 32? You basically have to figure it out and like programs that, that guess and are wrong or use a different alphabet, like just it all gets garbled and, and, and wrong. So why don't we just have a nice code that tells you what it is. This is a like interesting, tricky problem where each specific code also happens to be a byte that fits within the alphabet of that encoding so that it, it just all just nicely works. Um, so what a CID is, is a combination of these three pieces, a multi-hash, multi-base to, to allow the different bases, and multi-codec to allow different serialization formats to be invoked. Um, <laughs> this is basically it. Like, it's a very simple format that just has, like, the multi-base prefix, a version for the CID, you know, because we may want to change this in the future, and, like, if we change it, and, like, we already went from V0 to V1, so, like, you know, things may change, uh, and you always need a version. Uh, then you have, like, this multi-codec packed code that tells you, oh, this is a get object. Oh, this is an Ethereum object. Oh, this is a, you know, get object, and so on. And then you have the hash in the end. And so what that, what that gives you is the ability to, just in one simple hash value, understand what you're linking to, understand the hash function you're supposed to verify it with, understand um, you know, the, just the string thing that you're looking at is that, which base is that in. Bitcoin loves to use base 58, and like that set a precedent for everyone trying to use base 58 for everything. But it turns out to be slow. Or browsers aren't, you know, like the, are it, we just ran into this. I wrote like a very long email today about how you can, if you go straight into the browser and you want to use a base 58 hash as an origin, for example, for a, for a browser, that breaks because browsers assume that the origins are case insensitive. So now you can have two different hashes pretending to be the same origin. And you're like, what? So you have to now turn all of those things into you know, base uh, 32 or, or 16 or whatever. And you know, the fact that we have multi-base already saved our asses there. Um, cool. So does this, yeah. At the end of the day, this is just a format for the value of a link. For if, if your data structure started with these things, then you can point across them, right? So I could take a Git object, and I could write this hash in there. And now I can point to an Ethereum hash, or I, uh, now I can point to a Bitcoin hash. And so that's the value there. There is a problem of like, oh, wait, you can't rewrite Git. You can't rewrite Ethereum. And so you need to understand that in those data structures, they might have native links between objects of its same kind, and they won't be formatted like this, unfortunately. That's just a reality in that we can't go back and ask everyone, like, hold up, change these blockchains, rehash everything, just because we think you should. Uh, nobody will, will do it. So we need formats that are, that are understanding that, uh, how, how you can resolve through. And it turns out to be a pretty easy problem, because whenever you have an Ethereum hash on its own, you're usually in an Ethereum context. So you can assume that the thing that is not a CID is probably just an Ethereum hash. Same with Git, same with everything else. Oh, man. That's 20 minutes. So I will give you a quick example uh, in code, and then I'll you know, shut up and let other people speak. So uh, the basic idea is that we were driving for something like this, where whether it's a command line or, or, um, or code or whatever, you, you can grab an object. You know, this could be whatever you want. And you can marshal it. You know, you, what, whatever, here I left out which uh, serialization format, but suppose that this is just JSON powered IPLD. Uh, you have some you know, value. And then you can you know, get, its, get its hash. This will be CAD. This example is not super up to date. This, will, this long token will be prefixed with this other CAD stuff. Um, and then from there, you can do things, you know, you have now created an object in the IPLD world. This, this is, you should be able to re refer to this as well. Uh, so, you know, you can create another object, like, you know, you have hello and you have world, uh, and you have now two different objects, two different hashes refer to that object. And now we can write a third object that points to those two. You know, you have a third object that has a files ar array in it, and one object here is, you know, a link. This is how we structure links from one JSON 
I peel the object to another, JSON I peel the object, and you have the whole like value there. And uh, when you get the data of this thing, um, so this is the hash of the third object. So what's going on here is that these are hash links, and you get a structure that looks like that at the bottom, right? Like you have the object three pointing to the first two objects that I showed you. Given this, you can add all these three things to a system like IPFS or anything else that uses IPLD. And you can resolve each one of them, right? You can resolve the first one and get the data. You can resolve the second one and get that data. And then you can do this nice thing. Oh, so by the way, here, one cool thing of the path notation in IPLD is that you can traverse through these objects. Not only do you get each chunk of data, but you actually can use the data model, JSON-style data model, to traverse through and get pieces out. Uh, which will be really cool when you see some of the blockchain stuff. Like you can go into a transaction and just pull out like one of the values like really nicely, and it gives you effectively a JSON API for free. Um, and so you know you just add like append to the end of the hash like the path notation that you would you would want. Um, but now the cool thing is like once you think about three objects, you can you know resolve it and get that data. You can resolve it and you know get whatever the array is and so on. And you can what you can start doing is like you can traverse through transparently, right? So you have the third object, say slash file slash zero, would hit the, the first object, and that was native resolution. So what happened here was that, you know, it, it went to the third object, looked at the link, and said, "Great, let's resolve this and go and fetch the second link." Um, so that could have been a network call right there. So this could have gone out to the rest of the world, fetched stuff, and returned to you. What, when that happens and so on, it's all very system dependent, but. The cool thing is that you can start treating data in this huge data structures as just being ever present, and you just have some nice path notation through it. And you don't, it doesn't really matter how it's chunked underneath. You can still access all of it through this nice, very nice uniform path notation, whether it's in Git, whether it's in Ethereum, whether it's just JSON, you know, whatever. And the cool thing is that you can then create things like a file system, really trivially, and say, suppose that we had a function called cat file, and we're going to give it a link. And what it's going to do is it's going to resolve the link first. It's going to look inside of it. And if it has some data, you know, start a, a string. And then it's going to go over each of its underlying files and treat those as like subfiles, right? And say, like, you know, let's treat those three objects as files and say that the content of object, the, the content of the file described by object one is just going to be the data. The content of the file described by object two is just going to be the data. And the content of object three is going to be data if it has any, and concatenating the two things that it points to. So just with this, um, you know, if I cat file the first one, I just get hello. If I cat file the second, I get world. And if I cat file the third, I get you know the concatenation of those two things. So so this, you know, in, in five lines of code, you have a file system that it, that it gives you sharding of files, right, and can like uh, take huge things and break them up into pieces and you know, concatenate them over time. So you can do these things in code um, above IPLD, or you can start thinking about them in terms of transformations underneath the hood. Uh, I won't give you more examples, I think, because I've been going for a while. But that's, uh, other people will. And that's it. That's Enter the Merkle Forest. Thank you.